and welcome everybody to the first of our Planetary Conversations series. This is hosted by Planetary Leadership Training and we have a lot of other programs, but this is the first of our interviews and I'm really uh, pretty excited about it because this is about one of my favorite subjects and that is spiritual chanting or kirtan. And uh, I, um, I'll tell you, while people are arriving, just to give a little space, I'll tell you a little a kind of story about my exposure to this. So I was very attracted to meditation when I was young. I was 19 in New Zealand. And I went to this meditation center and they taught me like everything in one day. So I learned all of the, I'd learned my own mantra and I, they said, the, my, the monk who taught me, he said, oh, you've got to follow this strict diet and you've got to do these yoga asanas. And then his, his helpers, they spent, I was there for five hours and they taught me all these different things in, in Sanskrit and how to take a bath with cold water and all kind of discipl yoga disciplines. And I loved it. I thought it was great. But then they taught me this chanting thing and there's a dance that goes with it sometimes. And that was the one thing I didn't like, which is pretty crazy because I love it now and I'm a musician and, you know, so I took me a few weeks to get the taste of spiritual chanting. And now it's one of the main things that I teach and propagate, even though I didn't like it at the beginning. So today I'm going to be talking with Gemma Perry and I... Uh, came across Gemma's work when I was looking to see if there was anyone who had done serious research into spiritual chanting or kirtan. And it was really hard to find anyone. And I was surprised by this because there's so much research into meditation. And I was thinking, why is it that nobody's uh, researching this? So that's one of the questions I want to ask Gemma because she's been looking at this really deeply for at least last the last six years. So yeah, I'd like to introduce Yama Perry. She's an Australian scientist and yogini and uh, has been doing some research. This is what caught my attention. She's been doing some research at Macquarie University in Sydney uh, as a part of her PhD project. So um, I think you're almost you've almost got your PhD now, don't you, Gemma? Do you want to say hello? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I do almost have my, my PhD, uh, so we're about six months away from that. It's obviously had to be redesigned in the middle of the pandemic because uh, chanting in groups is not a very popular thing to do here at the moment, so we had to, um, yeah, make a few wild turns with it. But yeah, it should be, it should be finished in the next six months. Well, premature, early congratulations on that. You did a lot of work. Uh, so I want to start off, um, I, I'm going to quote something from, it was actually an article based on your, this piece of research, that particular one that interested me, it said the study found that a positive effect and altruism increased more following vocal chanting than silent chanting, which they're talking about silent mantra meditation, right? And that was what really caught my attention, because uh, you've been comparing yeah, basically mantra repeated mentally to mantra sung out loud. So that's something I really want to look, explore a little later on. But would you like to start off by telling us a bit about you and um, yeah, what's your background in chanting and meditation and yoga? And then tell us a bit more about your research as a, and your scientific work. Yeah, sure. So it was great to hear your uh, experience with chanting, like your first experience, because I guess I have like a similar one. Uh, so I started chanting um, uh, over 12 years ago and I started chanting and meditation because of my own mental health challenges. I had been diagnosed with severe depression and I had a yoga therapist at the time who recommended I try chanting. So I took myself off to a yoga studio and 
you know, it's not like now, you know, if I teach chanting, I might say, okay, let's hum, you know, we're, we're focused on the parasympathetic nervous system. This was not that, this was, there's a fire in the center of the room, you know, everyone's wearing orange and it was um, overwhelming at first. But what I noticed was that it, time just passed so quickly and I found myself back there the next week and the next week and the next week. And then I found myself also exploring other traditions. So I realized that, you know, the Buddhists were chanting and the Hindus were chanting and uh, there was Islamic prayer. I have a beautiful friend that chants in Hebrew. So I would do chants with him in his lounge room. And so I was just exploring all of these different traditions and I found that really uh, fascinating um, and also incredibly healing. So then when I came to doing my own research uh, in psychology, I was sort of got to tick a little form and you tick to your interests and there was no mantra meditation to tick. <laughs> so I ticked music and I landed in this um, lab at Macquarie University, which is the music sound and performance lab. Uh, so I was able to research chanting. Basically, the first day I was asked, what do you want to research? And I said, chanting. Uh, thinking that I would be, you know, shut down straight away, but I wasn't. My, my supervisor, who's just a brilliant man, Bill Thompson, uh, was open to that. And we've been researching it ever since. Um, and with another supervisor as well, Vince Polito. Uh, so we sort of bring these different worlds together. We've got the world of music and then the world of meditation. Vince Polito, he researches... Um, uh, altered states of consciousness, psychedelics, and hypnosis. And so we meet somewhere in the middle and we call it mantra meditation. Well, you got the perfect professor in Bill Thompson, didn't you? He's, you know, the little I know about him is, he seems like a really remarkable uh, mentor. And uh, that's really, tell us a bit more about uh, the other people you've worked with in the research. Yeah, so mainly it is with uh, Bill Thompson and Vince Polito. I mean, we have this incredible lab. So you're always working with the people there. We meet every week and everyone's sort of pitching in ideas. And uh, so they, they're a big part of it as well, my colleagues. And I also have a spirituality and science uh, group that I meet with. And yeah, so it's, Great. Um, so I want to pitch this question to you that I was asking earlier. Like you told me in the six years you've been exploring this, you've found a handful of serious, you know, objective studies into chanting, uh, you know, compared to the, you know, probably more than 2000 peer reviewed studies of silent meditation. Why do you think that is such a big difference? Yeah, I mean, it was surprising to us. Um, really surprising to us that there was so little research on this topic. Uh, we're talking about a practice or practices that are in almost every tradition and culture in the world. They've been practiced for thousands of years. Uh, we have Indigenous Australians here that, you know, it's possibly 65,000 years that they've been practicing this. Uh, in ancient Egypt, they would use chanting. They used to believe that by chanting, they would actually flood the Nile. So they believed it was having an effect on their environment. And then we have all of these religions that are practicing chanting. And yet science had just looked over it in, in some way. So what the science uh, did do was uh, transcendental meditation is a type of mantra meditation, that silent repetition. Uh, that was quite well researched, I think, from the 70s. And then mindfulness also was researched. So mindfulness being 
the objective awareness of thoughts or breathing or feelings. And that had been extracted from Buddhism, but we know that, um, of course, it's in yoga and many other traditions as well. So the science had focused on secularizing these practices. So transcendental meditation is, although it comes from, you know, the Hindu and the yoga, really rich traditions, uh, is focused on not having any belief system attached to it. And the mindfulness, although it comes from an incredibly rich tradition of Buddhism or any other of the religions that we can look at, was focused on this one aspect. So I think that's what the science did do. Um, the other problem that we have with the science is, so a recent review uh, done in 2018 looked at a review of mantra meditation. And I think it was about 37 studies they looked at and found 90% of them to be of quite weak quality. Uh, so, and of those 37, 78% of them were on transcendental meditation. So even that research has a long way to go. A lot of the mindfulness studies, they don't have active control groups. Yeah, so we've got, uh, even though there's a lot of research, we still, you know, it's but a dot in the, in the science. Well, this this um, is a kind of good segue into something that concerns me is the quality of research and the bias that people naturally have. Everybody has bias. Uh, and if people are studying their own practice, <laughs> like if I go and organize or find the funds for a study onto our meditation, who's going to take that seriously? Because I'm obviously biased. So that's what... Uh, yeah, I'd like to hear about your research because I know it's funded by the Australian government, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I would I would say that most scientists would be biased because like like I have come to this with a passion, many scientists come to their work with a passion, with an interest in the work. But what we do try to do is um, like what you're saying is, you know, if I found out that Hindu practices were better than Buddhist practice or whatever, whatever it might be, I would be happy to report that. Or even if we find that there's some negative effects of chanting, because sometimes we, you know, we know that this is sort of uh, brings up, we use that analogy of the, the mud at the bottom of water and stirring up the, the dirt. So some people might have some negative experiences and I would be happy to report that. Whereas we do get a stronger bias, as you say, if we have like a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, practice and person that has this, this belief system that's trying to prove just one, one thing. Um, so, yeah, my research is, is not funded by a particular practice. Um, I'm on a, a scholarship for my PhD. And that is a research training program scholarship, yeah, and that is the Australian government, as well as um, Bill Thompson and Vince Polito. They also have grants with um, the Australian Research Council. Great. Yeah. And, you know, no, nobody's objective, but I do think there is value in kind of following the money trail to see if anyone's got a, an interest, uh, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, well, well, what was the interest of the Australian government? I mean, what? Why were they funding this? What? What outcome were they hoping for, or what were they? What? What? What question did they want you to try and answer? Yeah, well, often uh, with um, with these things, you start off with a proposal, and that often changes. It's very competitive to get a scholarship. I I don't know exactly. They don't send you, you know, a nice letter saying this is what we really liked. They just sort of say, yes, you're in the program. Uh, so I guess they do look at things like your super your supervision team and what you're researching. And a big part of it is what that will bring to the community and the world, I guess. And a lot of it is a good time and a good place. You know, it's a good time for this research. And also, like we're saying, it, it hasn't been done. So there's really room uh, for it to be looked at. So what good does it do? What's the value or potential value of all this work you've done? Yeah, well, I really hope that there's value in my work because I have to say it is 
such a lot of work and when I'm sitting here you know just surrounded by numbers and data while everybody else is off at a nice kirtan I do ask myself <laughs> <laughs> why why am I here uh, so I hope that the value of this research is um, I hope that it, it finds its way into clinics where psychologists are able to prescribe. Uh, we want people to have lots of different tools. Mindfulness is a wonderful tool and cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been well researched is a wonderful tool and chanting is also a wonderful tool. So I'd love that for, to that, for that to be an option for people. Um, I'd love to see meditation taught as a subject in universities. And I also would really like, um, so what some of my research is looking at is different traditions, you know, that interest in, oh, Buddhism is doing this, Hinduism is doing this, yogic traditions are doing this, Islamic prayer, and looking at the underlying that these practices have beautiful differences and the diversity is wonderful but there's also this underlying similarity and you know are we possibly doing these practices as a way of um, having optimal psychological and physiological health and are all of them an option to do and possibly with science that allows for a conversation about acceptance of these diverse traditions and practices rather than saying mine is better than yours you know and I, I would I would love that too. So can you tell us a bit about what you you think you've discovered or you think you've discovered <laughs> I'm not going to use the word prove because I know that's a kind of dangerous word in science but what do you think you've learned of yeah, thank you. So no, it's not proved. Uh, we never use that in science. It's um, what we have discovered is a chanting uh, can decrease stress, um, psychological stress and physiological stress. We measured cortisol in saliva. And this was uh, basically 10 to 12 minutes of chanting om in a group uh, so not long and we've also found that chanting can increase uh, social connection or altruism as you as you spoke about before uh, so again it's just 10 minutes of chanting and people are basically reporting and this is self-report measures they're reporting to be kinder people so questions like, would you give up your seat on a bus? Would you help uh, a friend move house? Oh my gosh, so painful to help a friend move house. <laughs> so I think that if people are saying that, yes, they are more likely to do that, then they're getting much kinder. Uh, so uh, we've discovered that. We've also discovered that these practices are associated with altered states of consciousness. And that as well is uh, happening in many different uh, traditions. Uh, people are experiencing these altered states. Uh, there's a lot more, but I think that's probably. Yeah, no, this, this is cool. So um, one, of, one of the big problems that, you know, has, has really grown, it's, we've, got a, we've got a kind of an, um, a pandemic been going on that's been going on a lot longer than COVID-19 and uh, it's, it's pretty much worldwide and you know I'm sure you're very aware but you know it's really a stress related and it's leading to increased levels of anxiety depression and even suicide rate in lots of countries and Australia is one of them uh, did you find anything related to depression anything clear anxiety yeah I'd like to know what, what if you discovered anything clear about the effect of chanting on anxiety and depression yeah so basically stress um, is related to depression and anxiety and a lot of other health problems as well um, we 
has looked at uh, it's it's called a state trait anxiety inventory. So it is anxiety is included within the stress measure that we used, and we did find decreased levels of that. As far as depression, we've looked at uh, things like focused attention and positive mood, and they increase with chanting. So although we haven't used a measure of depression, uh, we basically know, so, so a lot of it is linking, you know, different ideas together. So stress is a huge contributor to so many problems and depression is one of them. Yep. And what we see is with something like a uh, focused attention that we require with mantra meditation or chanting, what that actually does is it trains our mind to do exactly that, to focus attention. And what our minds are doing most of the time are ruminating. And that's even if you don't have any mental health issues. So mm. most of the healthy people are walking around with, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. What's wrong with me? You know, and we just have this cycle of thoughts. They actually, they did a study on looking at it. This one was in, in America. They found uh, that basically 47% uh, percent of the time, an American is walking around not uh, focusing on what they're doing. And, you know, Australians as well. It's just that the study wasn't done in Australia. Um, so that is yeah it's not great it's not great you, you know you walk into the other room and you're like oh why am i here or it, <laughs> we all do it. we all do it and and so what mantra can do is help us to uh train that awareness and we we become more uh, mindful of our thoughts and more focused in our attention and what task we're doing throughout the day. And that has an effect on depression. So the other thing that we know about depression is that uh, mind wandering. So exactly what we're talking about here is when I'm talking to you, but I'm thinking about something else, you know, some sort of stressful event that's coming up it is um, related to unhappiness. So more focused attention is actually uh, helpful for depression. Yeah, this is of course related to the studies of flow states and stuff like that, right? There's, of course, and John Lennon, what did he say, must he say? Um, life is what happens when you're making other plans. So, you know, very, very cleverly put, but it's so true of so many of us for so much of our lives. Uh, and this is the outcome. It's it's not not perfect, not good at all. That's cool. So one of the things that I really stood out for me again, um, reading about your research was the compa the comparison of chanting out loud to silent mantra, mantra repetition. Can you go to more detail about what that might mean? How you found that? Yeah. So uh, in. Uh couple of our studies we have compared vocal chanting to silent chanting so we call I think you call it mantra meditation we just we just try and make it sort of really clear in the science this is chanting this is uh, so uh, we hypothesized that the vocal chanting would uh, lend more room for people to actually synchronize a little bit better together with a group so that altruism might increase more and that is what we found in our first study and we also as well as comparing vocal and silent chanting we also compared experienced chanters to inexperienced chanters so what we did find when we actually looked a little bit closer at those groups was that the experienced chanters were still getting an increase in altruism from the silent condition. Uh -huh. So even when they were sitting in silence together, they were still able to feel socially connected. But with the inexperienced, these people that had maybe tried meditation once or twice in their lives, 
they were higher on the altruism if they were vocally chanting. So it's likely that this is because of, so there's what we do with our research, we draw from other research. So there's a lot of research on synchronous activity. So even people rocking in chairs in synchrony together or drumming in synchrony together and drumming out of synchrony or rocking in the chairs out of synchrony. And they find that when people are in sync, that they're better able to solve problems afterwards or they're nicer. So there was this one with the drumming and they looked at whether the person would help the experimenter um, pick something up, you know, after this, they, they dropped something. And the people that had drummed in synchrony are more likely to help that researcher. And they do this kind of thing with kids, with four-year-olds. They've done music studies and they look at uh, how the kids cooperate afterwards. And it's it's better if they've been in synchrony than if they've been out of synchrony. So that's something that uh, we we think that that is related to. Well, that's a pretty big deal. If we can train kids to be more altruistic and nicer to one another and other people. Wow, okay. Um, so I have, I have a little theory which I told you about. I want to, I want to get your take on it. Um, just see if you think it makes sense. So comparing beginner meditators to more experienced meditators when they practice out loud chanting and silent chanting, both of them, so you've got four quadrants, I guess. And the effect on the more experienced meditators in the silence medita silent meditation is much more pronounced than in the with the beginners. To me, you know, I I taught a lot of people meditation over the years, and I th this is completely in sync with what I've observed. Um, this is not a scientific study; it's just a general observation with a lot of students over many years. But it's pretty clear that when people start out meditating, they're no good at it. I mean, they can't concentrate. <laughs> generally speaking, generally. So when they're sitting there in silence for 10 or 20 minutes or whatever it is, 90% of the time their mind, mind is still wandering. So they're actually only meditating for two minutes out of the 20, whereas the experienced meditator is actually repeating their mantra or focusing for a much larger proportion of the time. So naturally, you would expect the effect to be more pronounced. Whereas if they're in either group, if they're singing out loud, they're both singing out loud the whole time because it's pretty obvious if you stop. So, I mean, this may be simplistic, but do you think that's a factor? No, absolutely, that's a factor. So we did ask people, uh, how much were you engaged in the practice? Mm. And of course, we found that the people in the vocal chanting condition were reporting to be more engaged in the practice than the people in the silent condition. I mean, for all we know, and this is a lot of the problem with the meditation research as well, when you have people silently meditating, we have no idea what they're doing, you know? And if we know that 47% of the time we're not focused on what we're doing, then we could likely say that that's the percentage of people that are not doing anything when they're sitting there. Uh, so what we do have is exactly right with novice meditators or even experienced meditators because let's face it even when we've been doing these practices for a long time we do have our days that is like... that the truth <laughs> <laughs> you know all i want is uh something to eat or whatever it is and so the vocal condition we are vocalizing so even if we're thinking about all sorts of different things we are physically vocalizing so we are going to no matter what have an effect on our breathing so often if we're doing a mantra practice like om we're extending the exhale which is directly affecting the parasympathetic nervous system and if we're in a group, it's directly connecting us to the people in the group and harmonizing with the people in the group. And that's going to happen whether I'm thinking about my next meal or not. But with the silent practice, 
it really does require a higher level of focus and discipline to to be able to do it and the other thing that I would say is maybe with the experienced people being able to connect in that silent condition uh, what can happen is when you've been doing the practices for a while or when you're plugged into a tradition or a community by even reciting that mantra silently or vocally by yourself or with others you are connecting to that community or that practice or that lineage and that can help you to feel less alone in the world so I think that the social connection can happen even without without that. So I have two questions coming out of that. The first one is <clears throat> to continue my hypothesis. <clears throat> so many people find meditation, silent meditation difficult in the beginning because their mind wanders, they find they can't concentrate. And it's not a matter of education. You know, I teach a lot of highly educated people and they often find it more difficult because they're trained to think a lot <laughs> and they're really good at that, but they're not good at stopping thinking so much. So uh, they find meditation, silent meditation difficult. What seems to be happening here is that the chanting is easier and it's easier to get a result. And, you know, when people are starting at something new, they need to get some feedback. Otherwise, it feels like this is, this is all effort and I'm not getting any, you know, ice cream or whatever. It is, you know, So what I have found, again, in, in my own teaching is that the chanting really helps people in the beginning to get into the silent meditation. It's like the segue and it sort of also sets them up for it. So we, you know, as I'm sure you do, we, you know, you, pra you might chant for a while out loud and then you do some silent meditation and it puts you in the mood and makes it easier but also you get some more perhaps more out of it so then you're motivated to at least continue and get to the point where you're going to be getting something out of the the deep the, the silent meditation as well and that can of course go to other levels that perhaps chanting can't take you so that's kind of my theory is that, that you know if we and this is why I think your work I think your work could, is potentially so valuable and you know other this kind of work in specifically into chanting if we can establish or if, if researchers can establish the validity and the benefits of chanting in the same way that so much research has established the the benefit of silent meditation suddenly the whole thing becomes easier and instead of 20 percent of the people who know they ought to meditate actually doing it maybe it's 40 or 60 or more i mean it's got a huge potential impact and all of the outcomes that flow from that in terms of people's you know reduced stress becoming nicer it's 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 really big deal i think yeah i mean i i think you're right so uh it is easy it's such a simple practice um, the problem with the practice is that, or all of the practices, is that you have to do them. <laughs> like, you must take the medicine. Yeah. Uh, so it's like what you're saying. It's like if we're coming together in a group, we're making that joyful, we're making that easy and something that is in, enjoyable, then people are going to be more likely to do it and they may just stumble upon themselves in the process. Uh, and, and what a lot of traditions do have is different practices. So they have this practice that everyone comes together and chants and sings, and then they have a silent practice or a, a, a different mantra or possibly the same mantra, but you're doing it in a different way. And uh, we haven't looked at um, the science on that, but I do have a lot of reports of people saying that the practice in community helps them to then sit down and do that maybe more challenging, more disciplined, and, uh, and, and it also enhances that individual practice. So to refer back to what you said about the mindfulness, the research into mindfulness and the way that mindfulness has been kind of secularized in order to make it more accessible 
and more easily adopted, you know, less, it's less strange, um, less, looks less religious. So it's become very popular because of that, but something's been lost at the same time because it's been taken out of its context where they might have also practiced some, maybe some kind of chanting or music or some other techniques that make it easier and more enjoyable or more emotionally engaging. Yeah, absolutely. And also what's lost is philosophy and belief systems. Mm. So... Uh, ethics? Ethics. <laughs> <laughs> Little things like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a lot of meditation has been like popular for the atheist. And it's kind of like, hey, atheists can do this too. And that's, that's wonderful. But what we've been pretending is that the atheist has a belief system that is not uh you know that is based on science but science cannot measure everything and we can't put everything into science so the atheist really by saying that there's nothing has just as strong a belief system as someone that's saying there's something divine you know whatever it might be and the belief systems actually support people. So uh, like we were speaking about before, it could help with connecting to community when, um, when you're by yourself, when you feel alone and you have this lineage and you have this mantra and you have this place that you can connect within yourself anyway and philosophies so what a lot of these traditions have are incredible philosophies you know compassion kindness surrender and this is when like ego deconditioning comes into it if you are able to surrender or to even contemplate something bigger than yourself mm. and use your chanting practice to channel that then that can be very helpful. Uh, we know that when people have altered states of consciousness, if they have a spiritual belief system, they're able to uh, interpret that experience much better than someone that didn't have a belief system. I think that's a really important point because I've met a lot of people who have had different kinds of experiences, but if they don't know how to interpret them and put them in some sort of context, they can come out with a lot of crazy ideas. Like I've met three people who think they're Jesus. I really want to get them all in the same room, but I don't know whether I'll be able to do that. <laughs> but that's the, the cheeky side of me. But I mean, really, um, yeah, there's, there's the, it, these sorts of experiences that we can have, it, if we don't understand them, we can become deluded. Um, and 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 uh, these sort of deeper philosophies do create this a great context, so we can interpret the uh, these sorts of experiences. So that's that's more important than most people realize, I think. Yeah, uh, before that's... before I ask you anything else, I want to just tell everybody um, I'd like to invite questions in a little while from listeners, and oh, our number of listeners is going up. That's good. That's always a good sign. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'd like you to participate with your questions, but what, the way we're going to do this is please post them, in the, write them in the chat, and uh, Kapil's going to uh, um, select as many as we have time for in, in about, let me see, uh, five or ten minutes we'll have time for some questions, okay? Um, so rather than raising your hand, write your question in the chat, please. I have one more for you, um, and maybe we'll have time for some more. I would do want to you to tell us about what you're doing next also. Um, this was, now this wasn't quite, quite what I planned, but it did come to mind. And that is, you're talking about the effect of chanting together, right? In a group, in the same room, and all the, the synchron, what do you call it? Synchronization and the rhythm and all of that. It's, and of course that's, as a musician, I really get that. What about when we're separated by space uh, and we're chanting, uh, or we're, we're meditating together online as we've many of us have been doing for the last year does it still work uh yeah well i'm so glad that you asked <laughs> <laughs> so actually um i was mentoring an honors student last year during the pandemic so we had designed her project 
And then all of a sudden, you know, we went into lockdown here and everything had to go online. So we put this chanting project online and she had people coming together on Zoom. And as you know, we cannot hear people in synchrony on Zoom. But we had a, um, we used a recording of the sound OM. And so everyone was listening to this recording and they were chanting along with the recording. So we were trying to simulate them being in a room. And we actually found that, so we, we compared this time, we compared group chanting to individual chanting. And we found that the group online, the Zoom chanting, even though they couldn't hear everybody else, they were just chanting along with this recording, their social connection increased towards the group. So they were uh, more likely to feel connected to that group after the chanting, the individual condition, they didn't have a recording, they were just chanting by themselves. And uh, yeah. so they were synchronizing to anything. That sounds really, that's a really valuable, you know, uh, discovery, I think, because it's, you know, we, we think we feel things or sense things, but it's really helpful to have it somehow, at least to some degree, confirmed objectively. Um, and I know that, you know, it's, it's hard to do, you can't do that perfectly. But of course, in, you know, on our planetary leadership training platform, we've been doing online meditation chanting for the last year. And we were all, many of us were, said how surprised we were to find pretty much what you described. We didn't, I didn't expect it. I thought, oh man, I'm going to, I can't meditate in a, you know, chant and meditate in a group with other people. It's not going to be the same at all. It's going to be kind of sort of dry or, you know, but it's, it's not the same, but it's, it's halfway there. Yeah. I was Ooh. also surprised That's, Yeah. at how effective it can be online. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Great. And of course, that we can do things with these kind of, you know, uh, techno technological media that we couldn't do before, like what we're doing right now. We can, we've got this happening in four, five languages, including English, for, with people in many different parts of the world and all kind of different time zones. And you're on the other side of the planet and you're upside down or I am or one of us is. And <laughs> yeah. So it's it's bad, it's right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to, oh, we've got a couple of questions, good, but I want to bug you about one more thing here. Well, there's two. <laughs> one is, so you've got some mysterious research, and I know you might, if, I, if, if you tell me too much, you might have to kill me, and, you know, I have to decide whether or not that's worth it, you know. I mean, give me, tell me at least enough to tell me, <laughs> so I can make it, you know, an informed decision. Um, but um, <laughs> seriously, what can you tell us about the, and I know this was in the area of the different, types of chanting and mystical experiences. What can you tell us? I know, I think it hasn't been published or something. Yeah, so um, I don't have to kill anybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> Produce me. <laughs> uh, so we were looking at different traditions and um, altered states of consciousness. So whether people uh, different chanting practices were experiencing altered states of consciousness. And we also were uh, interested in whether certain characteristics of those people were enhancing the experience of the altered state. Uh, so we, um, we did find uh, about 60% of people were, uh, this, this is experienced chanters, you know, these are experienced yeah. people. And about 60% were having these altered states of, of consciousness. And we also found that to be uh, associated with uh, different characteristics. So the ability to... Um, to be moved by a piece of art or um, to go internally. So to, it's like, it's like focused attention, but to be paying attention to the inside. So if people had that ability, then they were likely to have these altered states. And also if their belief systems were strong, they were likely to have the altered state. 
However, the other thing that we found was if there is no, so there's sort of, um, there's sort of different paths that you can take because uh, we've looked at this uh, particular chanting called Takatina and it's a it's a new it's a new type of chanting i guess you know it's not a traditional technique it's developed by a composer and it is uh, based on simultaneous perception so you're clapping you're chanting and you're stepping in three different rhythms okay. and yeah so if i have a strong belief system, devotion, surrender, anything, it doesn't matter. I'm just focused on these different rhythms and that can also take me to a place. So it's interesting to see how we sort of can take these different paths to a, a similar destination. That's really cool. And one of the things that <clears throat> one of the things that gets people to focus and be in the present and not think about breakfast or whatever, is when they're forced to. I mean, in order to do these three different rhythms and things, sounds like they're really going to have to focus, otherwise they won't be able to do it. Or if somebody's surfing on a big wave, if they lose concentration, they're, they're going to fall off. And, it, you know, it, that's, well, there's a whole other thing about how adventure sports induce states of extreme focus. And that's part of the reason people become so hooked on them because they get high. When you're extremely focused, you tend to experience a, a, a better state of mind, a more uh, ebullient state of mind. So, yeah, that's yeah. That. So I think I think it, forcing people, in a sense, to, to really do a lot of stuff that, you know, it, it, uh, it stops their mind wandering. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you were talking about flow before. So flow yeah. is exactly. uh, a state that is usually... Uh, coming from a really challenging uh, task. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, states of flow can come from things like that, simultaneous perception or, you know, I'm starting to wonder whether meditation is an extreme sport because I'm trying to get ethics approval uh, at the moment and it is very difficult. Oh, oh that's that's quotable. I like <laughs> Well, research. No, it's, it's the research that's an extreme sport. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to um, look at some of the questions from our listeners. Thank you. We've got a few here. This looks fun. Let's um, let's uh, see what's there. Okay, I'm going to have to pick some. I don't think we're going to have time for all these. But we do have at least maybe 15 minutes for questions, probably a bit more. And I do want to have time to mention something kind of fun that, that we shared as well. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, this is a good one. Okay. How different are chanting effects from positive affirmations? Do you have any thoughts on that or do you look into that yeah we haven't looked into that scientifically i do have some thoughts on that and yeah. that would be uh things like with the with the positive affirmations um so i'm assuming things like uh people often use i am beautiful or i i, I am love or whatever it's it's often in um the native language and it's maybe using something um, to boost confidence or self-esteem. So what can happen with that? If you already have a certain level of self-esteem, then the positive affirmation can take you further and it can be fantastic. If you have a low level of self-esteem, then the positive affirmation can do exactly the opposite to oh what you God. want. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so by, by sitting in front of a mirror or whatever, however this is done, I am beautiful. If I already think that I am not beautiful or I am not smart or I am not, then it is just going to reinforce that belief system. So I think we just need to be mindful about how we're practicing um, this type of thing. And yeah, but they can be great. And, you know, we have Sankalpa in yoga. You know, I think that it's really important to sit down with an intention, but you want to make sure that your intention is really aligned with where you are in that moment. That's useful, really important to know. Thanks. <laughs> um, Okay, here's, here's a, a question from a friend of mine who I know happened to 
and I was a really good musician, so it's related to, related to music. There's a lot of great, uh, this is from Andy, Andy Douglas, um, there's a lot of great research about the positive effects of simply singing together in a non-chanting context. Of course, um, Bill Thompson has looked at that a lot, I guess, right? Um, yeah. Such as increased feel-good brain, <laughs> like that one, uh, feel-good brain chemicals like oxytocin, etc. Can we distinguish or compare the effects of kirtan singing from just choral singing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And we definitely could do that. Uh, it is what, what we would need to do within uh, the research is try and make sure that we have the same other variables. So sometimes people have, uh, well, there's been some research into a mantra versus a nonsensical sound or a mantra versus um, actually a, a Buddha, uh, like a way of saying Buddha's name compared to Santa Claus. <laughs> and, I like that one. <laughs> and so what I would say with this, I, I think it's going to come down to the belief systems and whether you believe in what you're chanting or not and how you're kind of connected to what you're saying. Of course, we have belief systems in mantra and yoga in all of these different lineages that we say that these sounds have been chanted for thousands and thousands of years and we're sort of adding to that vibration, but can science really test that? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we could start looking at the different sounds and the effects that they have on the brain. So, for example, a consonant can have a different effect than a vowel, you know, so that kind of thing we could look at. But I think that if we're comparing singing to uh, chanting, uh, I think it's going to be the belief system that's going to be the difference. Okay, interesting. There's, I mean, it, it, as far as the sounds go, as you know, you, you've, you've done a lot of Sanskrit chanting and there's a whole theory behind Sanskrit that it's, it is specifically chosen because of the effect it induces and that's all related to the chakras and all of that. But I, it would be really interesting to see if that can be empirically demonstrated in some way, but uh, I don't know if it has. Um, sounds like you haven't come across anything at least no, look, it's mainly just concepts and pseudoscience at the moment. That's so what I'm, there's a lot yeah. of claims, but I've it's across not. across that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So here's one which is sort of related. Um, so you've, you've, you've done this, you were using the OM mantra in, in one of your, exper uh, your yeah, experiments. Have you tr experimented with other mantras or compare them or anything like that? Yeah, uh, so I, it's something that I really would love to do. We haven't compared mantras directly yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we There have been some studies that have done, uh, so that, that one that compared Buddha to Santa Claus. Oh, yeah, that's and, <laughs> Yeah, and there was also a Hare Krishna uh, one that compared the, the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, to a nonsensical sounds, mm -hmm. and they found some differences. We have collected uh, data on all of these different traditions uh, and I did start to divide all of the mantras up, but in order to find a statistical analysis for that is a little bit tricky. We might not have sort of the right way of dividing it up, but it's certainly something I'm interested in. And it's also we have to look at these other variables of you know, the, um, you know, science gets really tedious like that. You have to look at the syllables of each of the mantras, you know, is it just happening because say J Hanuman is like this kind of like long sounding and Om Namah Shivaya is like a sort of a, a quick sounding. So it's hard to know what's actually having the effect. And again, we have the belief system. So if I'm sitting down and thinking that Hanuman is strength, and that Shiva is going to destroy my ego, then that's going to also affect how I, uh, you know, we've got the placebo effect as well. Uh, so it's just so many things to tear apart in the science, yeah. But it's something really interesting to look at. I would, yeah, certainly in the infant days, as far as this sort of research goes on, uh, somebody wanted some clarification on your, your comment about affirmations. Uh, Sue's asking, are you saying that if you have low self-esteem, 
you shouldn't use affirmations? Ooh, um, I guess what I'm saying is to really feel into what you're saying. So if you are saying something that you truly feel so far away from, you sort of want to be like, if I use my hands okay. as an example, you sort of want these two things to be close. You're just kind of almost like there and you just want to get there. But if you're too far away from it, then it might just have the opposite effect. So I would say to really feel into it. Of course, you know, we need to use whatever we can, especially with low self-esteem and to boost um, our confidence and acceptance of ourselves is really important. Um, but try and feel like you're aligning with what you're saying to yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, that was that's important. If anybody's got any follow up questions about that particular issue, I'd really you, you know, please put them in the chat. I want to prioritize those because it's uh, yeah, it's it affects people. Uh, well, I want to. Well, I'm. Um, there may we may get some more questions. I know I haven't. We haven't used all of them, but I'm trying to get some variety here. Um, I just want to tell remind tell people the story you told me. So we you know, we met online. Um, of course, um, Jonathan helped to connect us. By the way, he sent his best wishes. He can't join us today, um, but he's helping me with this program. And um, but then we discovered that we have a mutual friend. So you uh, met Sutri Katyal, uh, and you want to tell us that story? Because some of our listeners know him. He's, he's a, just for the others, he's a, um, he follows the same practice I do, um, but he's a, also a cognitive research scientist like you are, uh, but he's working in Europe. And uh, yeah, tell us what happened when you, oh, he's also a musician, does, is really into chanting and spiritual music. So what happened? Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, so Suturit, so basically I met Suturit at the first science conference I ever went to and it was my first science presentation and Suturit was that person in the audience that nods and smiles and if any of you have ever given a presentation that person is just like a blessing um, because it's yeah it can be hard. So that uh, was my first impression was of Sutrit. And then we spoke later about uh, the research and his interests. And I had actually just come from India and uh, also living in a tent in the, in the Bahamas. So in, in an ashram in the Bahamas. And so I happened to have a travel harmonium with me at this conference. And Suturit happens to play the harmonium a lot better than me. <laughs> and so we organized a, a kirtan at the conference and we invited people that we had met that day that had never experienced chanting. And you can imagine just uh, some scientists at a conference having a kirtan. So it was, yeah, it was a really beautiful uh, first science conference and Sutrit and I are still in contact and um, I was just uh, emailing him this week actually about a spiritual science group we're in. Oh, that, yeah, I was so happy to hear that you knew him because he's, he's, a, he's a good friend and, and we've been working on some research together um, and he's actually helping us. Uh, I'll tell you, we'll tell you a little bit about this program at the end where we're um, running a, an eight week course on meditation um, starting at the end of this uh, when is it the end of this month actually yeah and he's our science supervisor so the, the the course is a kind of research project so all the participants will be monitoring their own responses and you know uh, the effect they're getting from the meditation and we're going to use our app to help to collect the data and all of this stuff so he's helping to kind of we don't know how to do this stuff, so he's our science guy. Oh, that's great. I mean, you don't get a better science guy than that. Yeah, he's good. He's very yeah. good. Yeah, I'm seeing some of you know him. They like this story. They love your story. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, so I, I would like to know, you know, you've said that you'd, you'd love to know more about that or do maybe learn more about this. What do you, what are you going to do next? I know, well, okay, you've got six months more on your PhD, so that's priority. But... I'm sure you're thinking of something after that. Yeah, so I, I definitely know that I'm going to continue this work in some way. Um, I've still got a lot of questions about mantra. 
and I think the world does as well. So I do feel like this is going to be a supported journey that I will be able to continue. But I'm always involved in, in lots of different projects. And um, I just don't know, I guess, after the PhD, what container it's going to be in. But I will definitely be doing this work. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll be doing your um, <laughs> extreme sport of grant hunting, uh, I guess. <laughs> so you can research stuff that you're fascinated by and love, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's 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 terrific. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, have this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a researcher, but I'm really interested in doing what I can to support and encourage and spread this kind of research. So who knows, maybe we'll end up doing something together someday. I, I, I would, I would, that would excite me. Um, yeah. Well, you and Suchari, I'm going to be involved with his stuff. Yeah. I, I think what we, we might do now, and well, let me, let's see if, um, oh, just want to see if I might pick up one more question from here, because there are a few I've left unanswered. Um, Oh yeah, did you study musicians? I, I know. I think the answer might be wrong. No, but you might be able to tell us something about this. Did you study musicians as a separate statistical group? There's a lot of musicians here today. This is from Karun. He's a really good harp player. Did you study musicians as separate as a separate statistical group? Can you tell if musicians react differently to chanting? Right. Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't study them as a separate group do they react different to chanting? I think that's a great question and I have looked at it, but I would say uh, it would depend in what capacity they are. So for example, when somebody is leading the chant, uh, you know, you have to, you have to be a musician as well as um, chanting. You need to hold that space. So you can't sort of just drift off into a place where rhythm doesn't exist. You know, you need to maintain the rhythm. And so in that respect, I would say that, yes, for a musician, it would definitely have a different effect. Um, but, yeah, I'm not really sure how else it would affect them. I do know that there's, um, you know, like things with musicians that may be focused on the more granular aspects of the sounds. And, you know, often kirtan, I mean, kirtan is designed for devotion. It's not really complex, rhythmic, you know, uh, apart from this, this chanting, the simultaneous rhythms. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Well, I, I have an anecdotal piece there. It's, it's, again, hardly research, but... I didn't tell you the reason I didn't like Kyoto in the beginning. It's because I'm a musician and I was criticizing <laughs> from my arrogant musician's perspective, yeah. all about ego, right? Which tends to ruin everything. So stupid me was my, 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 my idea that, you know, I thought the musicians were no good. So I couldn't. Yeah, look, I didn't want to say that. But that is, yes. <laughs> I did. I, you know, I, I did it. I, I, I interfered with my own ability. You know, you know what was happening. <laughs> so, yeah, it does. And, and, you know, so you've got to learn, from my perspective, you've got to learn as a musician when you're playing kirtan or leading kirtan, it's not about you. It's not a performance. You're doing a service and trying to help uh, induce an experience in the group and it's very very important because you know musicians can develop big egos especially if they're good <laughs> yeah and you know, i think some of the best hands when the leader cannot even hold a note but they have the bhakti you know they have oh, yeah. the devotion yeah it happens and, and you know, again, for, well, we got another question about the leading the chant. So you've, this, we're on a little vein here. Does leading the chant have a different effect on that individual? Well, yeah, it's, it's well, I can, from my experience, absolutely. The, and part of it is what you were saying. It's kind of, you kind of feel responsible, which is, it can be a downer, but it doesn't have to be. It's again, it's, a, it, it's so you've got to, you've got to think of then, okay, I'm doing service. I may not actually be able to let go and 
go into this as fully as the other words would, but I'm, I can help make this better for other people if I, if I remain, um, if I continue doing things properly and focused. But it can also, uh, I don't know if it would be different if I wasn't playing an instrument, but sometimes leading a kirtan can be a wonderful experience, many times. It's very gratifying. Yeah, I'd like to hear from some of the other musicians here who lead kirtans. I know there's several of you. Anybody like to comment on that? Oh, in music therapy. Okay, we've got an interesting one from here on my. In music therapy, there are studies that compare musicians going through therapy versus non-musicians. Okay, <laughs> that's on a website, Norwegian website, voices.no. You can see that. You, that you might want to check that one out, uh, Gemma. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, musicians' brains, but you know, we're we're all um, uh, we can There's all be musicians. Someone asking about universal chants, I think. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, there's a question about a universal chant. Does your research with the Om mantra have you tried other mantras? Is that the one or another question? Yeah, what are some universal chants which anyone can practice other than oh, okay. Om? Positive effects to the being, irrespective of language. Well, you mentioned the Mahamantra from the Hare Krishna tradition, but you see it's yeah. universal to them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's you know. right. Yeah, I don't know that I fully understand that if it's um, trying to get away from the deities or whether it's trying to bring in the deities, but there would also be like the, the Bija mantras. Yeah. Yeah, I... I um... It's, it's very, I mean, I, I believe there are mantras that have, have an effect on, that can have an effect on anybody, but they've all got to come from somewhere. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not particularly a Buddhist. I'm a great admirer of the Buddha, but, I'm, but I love the Om, the Om Mani Padmi Hum mantra. It's a Buddhist mantra. Um, I think the universality of it is very much about you being open to, I can enjoy Hare Krishna chanting, I can enjoy... Ave Maria or Om, or, but it's, it's, you know, if, if I sort of think, oh, that's not my tradition or that's, then, then that's where the problem comes, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, also that could be different, um, different personalities, different belief systems, that kind of thing, because the, the other thing is, is if someone really believes in one path, I think yeah. that can be really great, uh, a great thing as well. And also, uh, especially some of the traditions have incredibly um, intense practices to do. Like if you have to do 18 rounds of 108 beads of a particular mantra every single day, I mean, you want to be committed to that tradition and, and it's a reason for you to keep going with those practices, right? Yeah. So I... I'm not sure, like, I, I don't think all of us have the karma to plug into all of the traditions and, and that's well, fine. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to imply that. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I think it's good to be able to enjoy them. But I, I, if I'm going to chant, I'll chant the mantra that I, that, from my tradition and I do that a lot. And then occasionally, but it doesn't mean I can't go to an, an event put on by somebody else and not enjoy it. Um, but no, I agree. And, I, and, you know, I use the metaphor of, you know, digging for water. You're in a desert. That's a very Australian metaphor. Uh, <laughs> and you know, if you if you keep digging shallow holes in lots of different places, you're not going to get to water. Yeah. But if you dig one hole deep, then you're going to get to what you need. And I and in you know, there may be there may be a number of places you could dig. So I think that's important to remember because yeah, it does take commitment to really go deeply into anything. Mm -hmm. As you've been doing in your research so diligently and bringing all this valuable knowledge to us thank you i think what we're going to do now well i'll just see if this okay i'm going to just one more indulge one more musician all right <laughs> so screw it again my experience as a musician playing an instrument it's part if it's part of an ensemble i can have a very deep experience being in the ensemble lets me be both focused and not as worried about having to hold the container all by myself that's beautiful. So that again, it, it's not about me. It's about some sort of collective experience and all contributing to it. That's that's the spirit of collective music to me. I love that. Um, 
Okay, um, what we're going to do is actually have experience some mantra chanting because we've been talking about it for a long time, but we ain't had no music. So I'm going to, you know, I'm f you can all sing, but you can sing with your microphone off, please. Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we me measured it today. The two of us are in the same room. So Kapil, who's one of the people helping me, and has to have his mic off where we get all this feedback, we've discovered that there's about a one-second delay from when I say something and when he hears it through the internet in the same room. <laughs> okay, so it takes that long to go to wherever, whatever tangle of signals and wires there are and get back to, to him. So when it's across the world, it's probably slightly more than that and it's all going to be different, so we can't sing together. So what we're going to do is sing, I'll sing the mantra, You're very. I encourage you to sing along, and the mantra, many of you know this, but not everyone, I guess this is the mantra you heard Sucharit sing, the Bhavanam Kevalam mantra. Okay, yeah. so I'm just going to type that in the chat. Whoops. And I'm going to make sure I put myself on mute. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and the meaning, oh, wait on, I've got to make sure it goes to everyone. All right. Um, so the way I, the translation I like is only the feeling of limitless love. So there you go. The idea of chanting a mantra like this is, as you've described, it's, it's both the sound and the, the kind of rhythm of it and the repetitiveness of it. <clears throat> and and that you're, you know, that's why I encourage you, to, you all to sing with your mics off so that you're engaged physically. And, but it's also about the idea and how you feel about that idea. And this idea of limitless love is something pretty universal, I, I, you know, that we can connect to the source of love within ourselves is kind of the, this, the feeling behind it. And I'm just going to grab my dear friend, my guitar. And this is my, my lovely new guitar, which is made in Ireland, and it's got Balaman Cable on it. You can see it right there. All right? <laughs> That's the mantra. <clears throat> so I'll just sing this for a few minutes. And I said, yes, well, let's see how, don't sit like me, because I'm having to adapt with this instrument and everything. Um, maybe have a sip of your drink, if you, so if, you, if you want to sing along, as Jim is doing. But make yourselves comfortable, sit, sit straight. And, you know, sitting straight, of course, you can breathe more easily. It means you can sing better. And uh, while we're singing, just close your eyes. And just do that now for a moment. Just close your eyes and... Just feel okay, what are we singing about? So here we're focusing on this idea, this feeling, feeling more than an idea of limitless love. And our experience of love comes from within us. That's pretty intuitive. And so the idea here is to connect to the source of love within yourself, to, to, to tune into what comes from the place where you've experienced all the love you've ever felt and all the love you will feel into the future and it has no end. So just close your eyes and you can join in as you wish.
keep your eyes closed. Let the mantra Bhavanam Kevalam continue in your mind silently, as though you're listening to it. You're the observer, and the mantra and the music is just being played back to you by your memory. Let it continue and feel that this mantra and this music is coming from a place deep within you. It's coming from the place the love comes from. And it's drawing you inward to that place. And as you find yourself there, you feel or discover that this experience of love has no boundary, has no limit in space or time. And the mantra is continuing your mind, reminding you of this feeling. And we'll just meditate on that in silence for a couple of minutes. Just to take a moment before opening your eyes, you might want to note how you feel. Maybe it's different than you felt before. We started the very short chanting and meditation experience. Maybe not, but you can take a breath now and if you want you can open your eyes. So we just have time for a few announcements, but before that, I want to thank you again, Gemma. I think, I really have a feeling that the work you're doing and this kind of research is really important. I think it could have a huge impact 
on the world and affect the lives of many millions of people. So I know it's really hard work <laughs> and I'm glad I don't have to do it, but I'm really glad you are doing it. <laughs> so yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we will meet again. And I know you have to take off in like nine minutes, but it's you, so you're welcome to stick around, but now you have to, you have to go off and do some work, probably perhaps yeah. related to your research. Yeah. It's Monday morning here, so I have to get to another meeting. Oh, it's so. Monday morning, of course, we're here on, it's Sunday here. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so thank you so much and thank you for all the questions and thank you for listening. I really appreciate having these conversations because they, they keep me inspired to keep working hard. You're getting a lot of thanks from all of our listeners here in the chat. You can see that. Okay, <laughs> much, I'll take off now. Bye. Very well, much appreciated. We'll, we'll talk some more soon. Bye-bye. Great. Right. So everyone, please stick around. We've got some really exciting things coming up if you want to go into the um, more deeply. <laughs> So you're too late, Karun, he's saying that she's free to tease me about my accent. So she's from Australia, I'm from New Zealand. We tease one another about our accents. But if you really want to know, I actually can't always tell the difference. But we, so this planetary leadership program is run by a lot of people, a large group of people. Um, and two of the others here who've done a lot, of, a lot to make this happen are going to tell us about what's coming up. So, Christy, would you like to lead off and maybe you and Isha take it together, take it from here, okay? Thank you, Dada. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here for our first uh, planetary conversation. Uh, I, we just really appreciate it, and we appreciate Dada, and we appreciate Gemma Perry. So um, here at Planetary Leadership Training, we're always trying to think forward and trying to bring new content and um, share and all this uh, wonderful things about meditation and all the other things that we wanna share with the world. So in that theme, we have a new course starting and I'm gonna share my screen um, with our website. And I believe Ashita is going to put it in the chat box. So let me share the screen. Um, is that coming up? Okay, so if you go onto our website, planetaryleadershiptraining.com, uh, you'll see a new uh, course box and it's called Mindfulness, Mindfulness and Beyond, a 60 day meditation challenge. And Dada did talk a little bit about it. Um, so it's gonna start Sunday, April 25th, and I'll open that up. And you can see, uh, uh, so there's a little short description about the course and the course is open to everyone. And you know, no matter where you're at in your meditation, wherever you're at on your, um, if you've tried it before, if you've been a long time meditator or um, it's, it's really open to everyone. It's uh, gonna be, I think a really valuable course we're having two great people teaching the course with over 70 years experience. And as Dada talked about, we're also gonna have uh, science research backing it. So that's gonna be a fantastic opportunity. And when you get to the website, you can go and you can choose an option. So it's really basically what contribution um, that you can make between $200 and, I mean, 20, <laughs> between $20 and $200. And you just click on that and you'll go to enroll and then it's gonna allow you to, um, oh, sorry, I had already added the course, so it's not gonna let me add the course. But once you do that, you guys can go through the registration and sign up for the course. And uh, again, we I hope to see you there. It will be a fantastic course. And again, it starts April 25th. It's at 1400 UTC time, which is 10 a.m. Eastern time. And um, we will, uh, and it'll be a class on Zoom. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you about. The second thing I wanted to talk to you about too is that PLT will, is on social media and Ishita and I and everyone at PLT have been working really hard and we're gonna try to bring a lot more content to social media, including Facebook and Instagram. So please stay tuned, please check out our pages and 
uh, like us, and then we will be sharing, I said, many things new, a lot of new content, and really trying to further grow our community. The next thing we talked a little bit, about, I think Donna talked a little bit about, and it's called the Bliss Timer. And this app is fantastic. Um, it is an app that it's available on Apple and Android devices. And it's the first app of its kind to bring high level meditation and yogic techniques available for everyone. It's free. Uh, just a little note, my mom uses it and she loves it. Uh, I think she uses it almost twice a day now. And um, it's great it as offers free, like guided and unguided meditation. So if you enjoyed the little music that, uh, that Dada played in the short little meditation, well, you're gonna love this app. It has a sleep timer on it. It enables you to track your progress and you can set up daily reminders and listen to your favorite kirtans and tunes. So again, it's free. It's on your Apple devices and on Android devices. And then the other thing we have is called Inner Song. And it's, um, it's available through the website. It's available on Apple devices, Android devices. They also have a Facebook and Instagram account. And it, the Kirtan music can be played in anywhere at any time. And it does not require the user to have the application open to play music. So you can listen while you're performing other things. So if you're texting or doing other things, like we're always doing multitasking, you can listen to Kirtan, which for me, it just really calms the mind and just brings a smile to my face. So all these things are uh, great. That both, like I said, the Inner Song Radio and the Bliss Timer are totally free. And again, uh, the Mindfulness and Beyond is open for registration on our website. So I'm gonna pass it to is, Ashita, is there anything else you wanted to say? No, everything's okay. I want to know if Dada and Tanada want to say something about what they are planning to this meditation challenge. Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, I will tell just a little bit about the meditation course. So actually this meditation course I'm doing with Dada Nabanila Nanda, and we are working hard on it. And we have the cooperation of we are working together with Sucharit. You heard Gemma talking about how she met Sucharit and I found it very interesting actually. So <clears throat> we are putting together a scientific part to the course to help people see let's say scientifically the benefits they are getting. Because we, when we do the meditation, we feel, oh yes, we are getting benefits, but we also want to add that part that you see uh, more concretely, because we found that people get more inspired to continue when they get also that aspect of the meditation. So you really, feel that, yes, I should go deeper in my meditation. I should give more time to it. So it's a very special course. It's the first time we are putting all these ingredients together. And uh, I wish most of you can join us for that. That's all. Thanks. I just yes. want to add one thing. Yes, this is one of the first, th this course will be the first full course that we are offering to the public through PLT. Up, in, up until now, they've been mostly oriented towards more experienced practitioners who are already meditating with another maga. But now we've decided after a year of practicing, <laughs> we feel ready to uh, launch something for the general public. So you can invite your friends. You can spread, spread the word about it on your social media. If anyone you think would benefit from a regular meditation practice, you can recommend them to this. Thank you all.